choosing to come to my talk uh, for the first session of the first Indiana Homesteading Conference. Um, this is what do you need to start to raise chickens uh, from a perspective of eggs um, or raising them for meat. I'm Bradley Wood, I'm a husband and father of four, and I have my oldest here uh, on the camera. Uh, she's uh, being a great help and uh, handed you guys some stickers earlier. I, I grew up in Indiana uh, near farms, but never lived on a farm growing up. And for six years, I lived out in California, uh, working a remote job and uh, as a web developer, and then realized that the money wasn't going very far out in California. So we could cheat the system and relocate back to Indiana, move towards uh, closer to some of my family. Uh, and so while we were out in California, the place that we were living at had a chicken coop. Um, and so we decided, let's try to find some chickens. Uh, and that led me to West Pet and Feed in El Monte, California. Not typically the place you would expect to walk into a building and see a whole bunch of uh, uh, poultry, uh, but it was a great resource to get me started. Uh, so I took home some chickens and uh, and uh, so then, let's see. So it came time to move and I loaded up our cat, our dog, and uh, three chickens. I made a little uh, transport crate and they were going from 70 degree temperatures down to 20 degree temperatures in the no uh, November of 2014. Uh, but I knew that they were nice and cozy because along the way I would check and they were still laying eggs. Um, so, uh, that sort of started my chicken journey and we ended up relocating to an 8 acre homestead in East Central Indiana and I figured we have this barn, we have this acreage, let's put it to use. Um, so, started raising chickens for eggs um, and how many of you here currently have chickens? Raise your hand. Okay, how many are wanting to get chickens? How many are being um, sort of bullied into getting chickens but don't want chickens? Any, any, any of that here? Okay, well, um, I wanted to let you know um, of, of, an, of an option that I feel is very uh, risk-free. Um, so it's a good situation uh, if like kids are pestering their parents to get chickens. Um, there is a chicken rental package option. Um, so I, I offer it on my website, but I'm, I'm the Central and Southern Indiana representative of Rent Chicken. And what it does is it provides uh, two or four hens for three or six months. It provides the chickens, the coop, the feed, the water. And then at the end of that rental period, there's a buyout option. Uh, now, you will not save money on eggs from the grocery store by doing this, but it's a great way of two weeks into it, you realize, oh, chickens are not a good fit for our family. What was I thinking? You just call me up, I uh, do a prorated refund, and I take it back. Um, and so that, that is an option that's out there. If you're kind of on the fence, um, and, and what I end up doing is I send out a book, uh, Stories uh, Guide to Raising Chickens, a month before the drop off so you have some time to read up on it and stuff. Um, but I just want to let you know that there are some rental options out there. Um, every, every supplier is a little different um, in, in that. But, um, but yeah, so today I'm going to cover um, breeds that are great for eggs, meat, or uh, dual purpose. I'm also going to recommend uh, starting out with adult chickens. Um, because that is the minimum amount of infrastructure you'll ever have to have to raise chickens. With baby chicks, you'll have to have a brooder, heat lamp, and the baby chicks uh, can, can be a little bit more difficult to get going. So if you're new to chickens, I'd say um, adult chickens would be a good way to go. Um, now, you might be able to get some older hens, which you won't get as many eggs that way, but you can at least build a foundation of knowledge, um, and they're pretty resilient. Um, I feel like that chickens um, are a good 
farming gateway drug per se. Uh, but you gotta watch out for the side effects of chicken math. You start with two, turns into 10, turns into 20, and the next thing you know, you're raising 450 meat birds in a year. Um, okay, so um, I'm also gonna talk about uh, the three things that you need um, for raising chickens, shelter, water, and feed. And uh, several of these things I've learned over the years, so I'm gonna talk from my experiences. Uh, I'm not a vet, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, an animal educator per se, but I'm gonna share with some of the things that I've learned over the years uh, with raising uh, chickens. So one thing you wanna keep in mind too is what is your end goal? Is your end goal to provide eggs and meat for your family? or do you want to sell eggs or meat? Um, because depending on what your end goal is, kind of depends on what breed you go with. I'd say if you're wanting just a homestead backyard flock, then have a dual purpose bird that will, allow, that will give you some eggs, but then let's say I'm hungry for chicken, okay, put a bird in a stew and you're good to go. That's, that's a nice option to have. Um, if you're wanting to do it for a business though, you really want to make sure that you have some egg layers that aren't going to go broody and, and delay and, and cause other chickens to go broody and, and sit on the, the eggs uh, to try to nest them. Um, so really just think about what your end goal is. Uh, now when I started raising chickens for eggs, um, there's also a certain level of quantity that you need in order to have multiple um, customers. Pretty much the, the capacity that I had at that time was one customer down the road and I would uh, sell them the eggs and it was pretty much I would get $40 and then I'd take that $40, go to the feed store and spend $30 on the feed. So that wasn't uh, very profitable um, in, in a sense but um, so you want to select the right breed. Um, egg laying breeds typically lay between two to three hundred eggs per year um, and then there's uh, some attributes that are associated with uh, good egg laying breeds. They're not inclined to go broody or to sit on the eggs to nesting. Now, now the issue with that is if you have um, a rooster in your flock and your hens are typically sitting on them and you're not getting those eggs right away, um, my general rule of thumb is I don't bring an egg into the house for our consumption if I haven't gotten it by day two. Day three, if I know that there's not a, a rooster in the mix, um, but you do not need a rooster in order for chickens to lay eggs. Um, and uh, you just need a rooster if you want to incubate those eggs for chicks later down the road. Um, and another attribute, of course, is that the breeds lay a large number of eggs. And you'll also notice that uh, you'll all also notice that um, the egg production will decrease as you get into the winter time, uh, unless you add artificial uh, light. I would say if you're uh, raising a homestead flock, that then just let let the chickens do the natural rhythm of, of um, molting in the winter and uh, decreasing the number of eggs. Because pretty much when you get a chicken, they're, they're, they're born with a set number of eggs. Um, it's just how often are, are, are they going to lay those over three years or two years. Um, it, it just kind of... Uh, uh, are, are some factors to think about. Um, so some egg laying breeds that I enjoy raising are Rhode Island Reds. Uh, they lay about uh, 260 eggs per year. Labor, uh, 280 eggs per year. Bard Rock or Plymouth Rock are 280 eggs per year. Golden Comets, 250 to 300 eggs per year. And Australorp, uh, 250 eggs per year. Um, and I have been breeding the last couple of years um, some Australorps from South Carolina, or uh, they were raised by uh, Pat Whitaker, and 
and she's been raising this breed for production. Uh, so not really for show, but what's quite amazing about it is uh, how large the roosters are. So the roosters come up to about here on me, uh, which ends up working great for a uh, dual purpose bird for the homestead um, because you're able to get that meat. They're, they're nice and, um, and they, they lay eggs really well. Um, Isa Brown, um, I would say is probably the top egg layer if you're um, 300 to 350 eggs per year. Um, my general rule of thumb is within a one week period, uh, I'll probably get five eggs a day from uh, a hen that is uh, producing eggs well and not having those uh, seasonal factors at play. So when it comes to meat breeds, um, you want them to grow quickly, be able to scratch, and look for bugs and other natural treats hidden in the grass. Um, and uh, I would say that if you're just starting out for, for meat, um, to go with the Cornish Cross, especially if you want to make money off of it, uh, because you'll get that foundational experience and then you'll also start growing your customer base um, because if, if a customer is going from the grocery store to your chicken they don't necessarily want a big gap like raising it out on pasture will give it more flavor um, but they might not be quite ready for a like freedom ranger one that has a little bit more dark meat or uh, forages more now uh, another thing is that not all Cornish Cross, like not all hatcheries have the same genetic Cornish Cross, so they kind of vary. Um, I was at Homesteaders America uh, earlier this month and Joel Salatin was saying that, um, that, that pretty much the Cornish Cross, they're always like trying to tweak an issue with them. Uh, and so some uh, hatcheries will, uh, will get larger, some will have uh, some, some health is issues growing out. But, um, so the Cornish Cross, you can raise them 8 to 10 weeks, and uh, it will range between 8 to 12 pounds, uh, the live weight, and they uh, relatively grow fast, and, um, and uh, yeah. And then uh, Kosher King takes about 12 weeks to uh, get them to butcher weight, Red Rangers, 12 to 14 weeks, and a popular breed that's coming up now is the, the Breast um, at 16 weeks. Uh, some of the features with that is that you can incubate them yourself. Um, they do have sort of more petite bones, so you're getting more, um, more meat per bird. And then, um, where this breed came from, they have a particular like finishing them off with uh, milk in their feed, which is supposed to um, create an a interesting flavor and stuff. Um, so, uh, but the, uh, the Red Rangers um, forage and uh, let's see, so I, I've gotten some Cornish Cross from the farm store and they would get big, but they'd be super sluggish. I've gotten uh, Cornish Cross from Cackle Hatchery, and they don't get as big, but they like to, um, like they'll, they'll roost on stuff. So in my chicken tractors, I have, uh, which are movable chicken coops, I have these bars, and they'll, the smart ones, when I move them each day, they hop on that. They, they know, hey, it's moving time, I'm gonna hop on this and, and, and go. And then uh, my other thought, if they're crawling over the root, the loose bars that are like three inches off the ground, then maybe that's creating more uh, muscle, um, more meat for the, the chicken when it uh, gets processed. So uh, now talking about uh, shelters for meat birds. Um, I am an APA member, which stands for the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend raising meat birds in a movable chicken coop called a chicken tractor. Um, there are various styles and various well-known designs um, and a few less-known designs. 
Um, but I try to stay between 1.5 to 2 square feet per bird. And um, so a really popular chicken tractor design is a Siskovich chicken tractor designed by John Siskovich. Uh, and if you go to the link on my website, I have a link to his book um, on there that you can purchase the, the, the instructions on how to build it. But pretty much what it is is a 5 to 8 foot uh, chicken tractor and I built mine five years ago and it cost uh, $250 in supplies. I don't know what it would today. Um, and so that gives you 40 square feet and that means about 20 to 27 broilers. Um, and if you just decide to build that, I recommend uh, watching a video by Brandon Kleinman on YouTube. And then Homesteader, Homestead Evolution also has another tips video with that uh, because what, uh, some of the drawings uh, don't line up or there's other ways of, uh, of building it that uh, they have some tips and tricks that uh, help make it easier. Um, but that chicken tractor has two wheels on the back and then there's a door that opens so you can go into it standing which helps make it easier. Um, I have one of those. Um, and then I have uh, three Peterson chicken tractors uh, sort of falling, falling behind that. Um, so my John Siskovich chicken tractor, I have a water tank on it, like a 15 gallon water tank. And then the other chicken water, uh, um, chicken tractors end up having the water's daisy chain to them. So the Siskovich is the, the, the wheel house and um, the workhorse. The others, um, so so the Peterson chicken tractor is eight by eight, and it's uh, at the highest point is only thirty six inches tall. Um, so it had so it can handle really strong winds. I've had it not flip over from I'd say sixty to seventy mile an hour winds. Um, the top of it is a tarp roof, but how it's built, there's these sections that hinge and go down, and when it when it locks down, it makes that roof uh, tight uh, so that it repels the, uh, the rain. And um, the creator of it is Lisa Peterson. Um, she is up in Canada and she had posted some pictures on um, Pasture Poultry Facebook group. And I asked her for permission to tweak it and uh, try to come up with some designs. So I have uh, some designs for it on my website that I sent her some royalties for that. Um, but what I like about it too is that it's eight by eight and it's built with uh, two by three lumber, so it's lighter. Uh, with chicken tractors, you've got to decide, are you willing to fire up the four-wheeler or the tractor every single day to move it? Or can you make it light enough that you can move it by hand? Because um, it never fails, like Saturday morning, it's raining, it's pouring down rain, and it's an awful time to do chores, but you gotta go out there and do it. And um, so you kinda have to weigh that balance, the flexibility or the large capacity that you have to um, have mechanical advantage to be able to, to, to move it. Um, and, and then the other thing with the Peterson chicken tractor is that it does have like four roost bars that go across the bottom uh, up about three inches so it kind of like nudges the birds along uh, and then let's say there's a rainstorm and you're not able to get back to them it gives them a way to get up off the ground out of the puddles um, so I like I like that aspect of it um, and then I run uh, two three and a half gallon buckets suspended for watering and then daisy chain the chicken tractors together so I've at one point gotten it to where it takes about 15 minutes to fill up that water tank and then feed all the, the chicken tractors and move them in about 15 minutes for three chicken tractors. Um, so it ends up being pretty efficient. Um, another design is a Joel Salatin style chicken tractor and that is a 12 by 12. Um, and then he also has designs on how to make a dolly to be able to make it easier to pull it. And so that gives you 144 square feet which can hold 72 to 96 uh, chickens. The other thing you've got to keep in mind too is 
is your ground up and down. Um, the larger the footprint of your chicken tractor, the more gaps and other stuff underneath that. Um, so if it's smaller, then uh, I, I end up using old feed bags and just shove them under the edges so that the, the chickens don't get out. But as they get bigger, um, they, they end up not sneaking out. Um, and then there's the Simpson chicken tractor designed by Darby Simpson and it uses a wooden frame that gets pulled along the ground with a arched cattle panel over the top and then there's tarp and then there is a sheet of like plastic roofing or tin on the back to keep the wind from blowing um, and I'm not exactly sure the, the size of those, um, but that's a way of, of being able to raise a uh, decently amount more birds. Um, I have seen some of those flip, um, so if you're in a windy area, you might want to make a, a mechanism for anchoring it to the ground. Um, and then uh, shelters for egg layers. Um, just trying to sure I'm staying on time I got okay we're at 21 minutes okay I'll try to pick up the pace um, so shelters for egg layers uh, most chicken coops available on Amazon are way smaller than they appear I'm just giving you that warning from experience um, and they might stunt your dreams of having a flock of 10 um, now for my rental package I do use the Sentinel brand chicken coop from tractor supply and uh, that can hold uh, three to four birds comfortably and up to six if they're bantam size. Um, and that's made with metal and has some wood on there. So I do like that um, sort of prepackaged uh, coop style. But with that, I would still recommend building a larger run to give them room to go. And you also want to make sure that roost bars are higher than the nest boxes, uh, or otherwise they will poop in the nest boxes at night. And best thing is, is if you have a nest box that you can block at night if you're not able to um, have the height. Um, so an example would be a Anna, I think an Anna White um, A-frame uh, chicken coop. She has the nest boxes up in the peak of it and then the roost bars are down below. So in that case, you'd want to be able to put something in there to block them from that after you've gathered the eggs. Um, and then if, you're, um, if your flock is free ranging or out in a chicken uh, tractor that you want them to be able to free range, then I recommend incorporating an automatic uh, coop door at our table. Um, we have two styles. Um, I know it's a big investment and so I wanted to be able to allow you to see them in person to see what you would be getting. Uh, one that's made in uh, Europe and one that's made in China. Um, and they have um, pros and cons to each of them. But, uh, and then if your flock is stationary, you'll want to use a deep litter method, uh, which um, means that you're putting carbon um, base litter, like pine shavings, leaves, grass clippings, in with the, uh, the manure, and then with the chickens scratching around, that helps um, give it more oxygen, so that that will help break down ammonia. If, if your coop is smelling, if it's not able to get dry, uh, that can be problematic for your chickens. Um, and then um, waters. Um, so I'm going to try to not be biased, but I'm going to talk from my personal experiences. Uh, my oldest over there uh, that's filming, um, I had to go away for a work, uh, uh, I had an overnight work, and uh, my eight-year-old is not able to twist the top off of this. So there are backing stuff. This is what I'm calling like a backing style of water, where uh, this has to be sealed in order for the water to not go out. So you have to move this, put it down there, open that up, fill the water. And yeah, it holds a lot of water, but it's not great. And then this is another style where you got to twist it off, 
flip it over and it just is really problematic. And then this one is, um, I, I, I use this sometimes in the, in the brooder. Uh, this is like a dual purpose, so this way is water. And then if you flip it the other way, you can use feed in it, which is kind of, kind of, kind of useful. Um, and then there's uh, some, um, let's see. So then there's the bucket style, um, and these can have like water cups. Uh, this one has like a little float in there that uh, stops the water from flowing. Um, and then uh, this is one that I make um, where it's a two gallon bucket and then it has a float valve in there. Uh, and that float valve allows you to hook it up to a garden hose or a rain catchment system, and um, the chickens will have fresh water. Um, part of having a, working 40 hours a week, I didn't have a lot of time to do the chores, and I was like, if I can simplify 50% of the chores for the chickens, then that will help. Um, so it doesn't need to be five gallon buckets uh, that I have to manually refill um, if it's refilling automatically. Um, and then these are uh, the horizontal water nipples, which in our cold winters are the ones that I recommend um, because these, the water's outside the bucket and it will freeze. I do have a heated, um, heated element that I drop down in this uh, cap. Uh, I can remove that, put it in there, and then during the winter time I manually refill it. But uh, this is the uh, garden hose adapter. So when I was talking about daisy chaining my uh, meat birds, uh, my meat chicken tractors, uh, it just has quick connects, kind of like shark bite. And you can go on Amazon and there's a whole bunch of uh, kits and ball valves and splitters and stuff that you can hook up. And that ends up being a really easy system. And then this is reverse osmosis tubing. So like one fourth inch blue tubing and it, it works really well um, and then you can route that on your um, various uh, chicken tractors um, and did I did I burn up all the time okay we're like three minutes left um, before questions um, and then there's a fountain style um, which is like a bell and, and they're red uh, the downside with that is the chickens can put a lot of, um, can get a lot of debris in there, um, but sometimes you need it for, uh, I think a good use case is turkeys. Um, they have some bell waters that are specifically designed for turkeys to be able to get their um, bigger uh, beaks in there. Uh, and then the other thing you gotta keep in mind if you have ducks, they need to be able to submerge their face. So what I do for my ducks is I get a turkey pan, put a heated element in there, fill it up, they get to splash around. Yeah, they make a mess, but they get to do what they need to do for um, their water. And then when it comes to uh, chicken feed, uh, there is a chick starter, and that is recommended for day one till the first egg arrives around week 18 with a protein of 20 to 24%. Uh, the feed is finer uh, for the baby chicks. Um, and then you also gotta remember to give them grit. Uh, I ran into the issue this last year where I didn't give them en enough grit early on and they got a um, uh, blocked uh, crop or an impacted crop um, and that's where like a blade of grass and stuff gets in there and it, it, it's not fun. I had to um, put some, some of them down. Um, and then for layers you want to remember um, have uh, oysters also. Um, I've, I've stuck with uh, feeding my birds non-GMO, non-medicated, but there's a whole slew of options out there. You can have non-soy, organic, corn-free. Um, I would say if you're wanting to do it for a business, start off with non-GMO to set yourself apart from um, the grocery store, but build that customer base first and then ask your customers, is this something that you're wanting um, if you want it non-soy for a particular reason, then are you willing to pay for that um, additional cost? Um, and then just real quickly, um, look closely at the label uh, because sometimes it may not be clear. 
if it is medicated or not. Sometimes they're a little tricky with the, the marketing terms on there. Um, and then for general health, uh, pasty butt is uh, what I call when, um, you'll, you'll see this at the farm store sometimes. Uh, it's, it's where the, the chick, uh, due to stress, um, uh, ends up getting uh, uh, chicken poo on their butt, uh, pretty much. Um, and so if you see that at the farm store, I would not pick those chicks. I would try to pick some other ones. Um, but if, if you get them home and you see that, I take a warm uh, washcloth and uh, damp the back, get it clean, and then also make sure that you're cleaning your bedding uh, with, uh, with baby chicks. And then um, there is also um, coxiosis, um, which is a parasite. Um, and I experienced that one time with some meat birds. It kind of looked like the, their feathers were like frizzled um, and they weren't the frizzle kind of uh, birds. And so um, it, it kind of looked like that they were, they were wet, but they, they weren't. Um, and so that's, so look out for that and, um, and then research ways to um, take care of that. And then mites, you wanna look for scabs near the vent, eggs on, um, uh, mite eggs on the feathers and feather shaft um, and a light colored bird feathers may appear dirty in spots where mites have left their droppings or debris. And then rye neck, is a tough one to, to watch, but it's pretty much where like they have trouble keeping their head upright, upright and it kind of like twists. And that can be caused by genetic disorder, vitamin uh, deficiency, or head injury, or from ingesting uh, toxins. Um, so I just want to uh, thank you for coming to this. I hope you got some uh, pieces of knowledge um, to help you on your uh, chicken journey. And just want to remind you that I have a booth set up um, where I have the, uh, the chicken waters and other supplies set up. And then I also have two automatic chicken coop doors on demo so you can see what, uh, what they are. Um, and we can open up for uh, quick questions. Let's see. Yeah, so we have uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions. Yes. Could you uh, tell me the names of the egg-laying chickens again? Oh, yes. Um, so Rhode Island Red, 260 eggs per year. Leghorn, or some people uh, pronounce it like Leghorn, um, 280 eggs per year. Bard Rock or Plymouth Rock, and those are like the black and white speckled um, ones, are uh, 280 eggs per year. And then Golden Comets are 250 to 300 eggs per year. And then Australorps are 250 eggs per year. And then Isa Brown is 300 to 350 a year. Yes? Uh, can you also do the little rates? Oh, um, yeah, so I would, so let's see, do I have the other one? So, so dual breed, I would recommend Oshelor, um, also Brahma, they get pretty big and they were that breed that went viral, um, which I think that video went viral because of the, per, um, the, the viewpoint of the camera made it look ginormous um, but uh, but yeah those those will get bigger um, they'll just take a lot longer um, so um, let's see yeah sorry I, I ended up not flushing out that bullet point as much as I had hoped um, yes um, would you recommend sand for inside of a coop so I've read the blog post about that, um, and I had thought about doing that, uh, but I ended up not doing it, um, because it can end up building um, uh, 
bacteria and uh, dampness. I I just what what I typically so during the winter time in my barn I have uh, two uh, corn crib that's converted into two chicken coops for the winter time. And then what I end up doing is I put pine shavings down on the bottom, and then I put some straw on top for winter bedding. That way, that pine shaving is small enough that when I take the shovel against the concrete, I can I can get it up easily. Um, so so yeah, I I wouldn't recommend the sand. Um, just yeah. Did you have a question? When do you usually start the layer? Oh, so, um, yeah, the layer feed is at uh, 18 weeks or when you get that first egg. Um, and the layer feed ends up having more um, that calcium for the, the chickens to um, have a harder shell. So you mentioned doing them in the water. Yeah. I've, I've known there's two schools of thought. One feed, they're fine, whatever they're in, and there's others that them up and take care of them like pets. Well, so my first couple of years I put in a heat pad and stuff and then I realized that the breeds that I was raising can actually generate a lot of heat. Like I went out there and there's steam coming off of their comb and stuff. So how a chicken keeps themselves warm is they fluff up their feathers and they trap in that heat. So, so the other factor too is you need to make sure that you have enough chickens that as a collective whole can retain that heat. You also want to make sure that you keep uh, any strong dra drafts coming in and that will deflate that air that they're, that they're keeping hold to them. So I, um, chickens are pretty uh, hardy. Um, and the other thing I've done is um, I put like Vaseline on their combs, like the ones with the big combs, or on their feet to try to prevent uh, frostbite on those. So if you live in a really cold place, I'd recommend getting chicken breeds that have smaller combs and, and kind of keep everything closer to them. Yeah. So uh, farmer next door has a whole bunch of corn, and I didn't know that things be ground up or you get corn from the corn Um, I. Um, how old are your birds? Um, they are just now at past 16 weeks. Okay. I mean, they would they would probably eat it. It would just be easier if it's cracked. Um, Is there more though? Like full corn? Yeah. yeah um, I I've, I've actually seen one of my roosters grab a mouse, throw it up in the air, and then swallow it whole. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You ever have any trouble with predators or your tractor? Okay, so the um, the Peterson chicken tractor, there is a part on it where the tarp comes at an angle, and then there's kind of like a, a gap here. I use bungee cords to to, to bring it down, um, but uh, I haven't had any issues with with that. Partly because I I got a livestock guardian dog and once I got him I didn't have to worry about reaching into the nest box at 10 o'clock at night and there being a skunk because uh, that happened uh, before and so pretty much the skunks the raccoons and the possums all sort of disappeared just from his presence of bark um, but so it's probably gotten me a little lazy on my predator protection. Another thing you can do is you can raise some uh, guard geese with the flock. Um, so for a period of time, I got a cheap uh, carport from um, Menards and made a 10 foot by 20 foot uh, chicken tractor that I had to move with the tractor, but then I would day range them with a guard goose. And the guard uh, geese ends up um, helping protect from air predators. So one thing you can do is, um, there, there's a electric poultry netting, and you can make long, skinny runs, um, so that you kind of have to see like where your power lines are. Like red-tailed hawks, they like to stay up there. So if you make it 
long and skinny this way, they'll be less likely to be able to dive bomb there. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I've gotten kind of lax with, uh, with having a livestock guardian dog protecting everything. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes? Yeah, you want to try like, still using feed, but having a large part of their diet also just be like foraging. Yeah. Are there certain things that would be best for plants that some would be the best bang for your there? Um, I would say that there's a lot of like um, cover crops, like clover would be a great thing that they love. Um, now, I because I've been breeding the Australorps, I've, I've had to keep them separate in order for me to know that like, the baby chicks that I'm hatching out are Australorp. So what's what's cool to do is compare the egg from the free ranging out in pasture and the ones that live in the barn, and it's like night and day with the uh, vibrancy. So it's that diverse diet that really benefits the uh, the, the chickens and the uh, the eggs. Um, so I. I don't know off the top of my head exactly what would be best, but I, I do know like that they they love variety and um, and uh, and also with the chicken tractor you move them each day, so they get that fresh buffet of um, of grass and, and, and the pasture. And if you go out and look, grass isn't just typically grass unless you live in suburbia. Like it's a lot of different things. Any other last question? Yes. How many spare feet for like egg layers in a coop? Depends on your company for that. Different. Yeah. So it it kind of depends um, if the if the coop that you have gives them ability to roost. Um, like if you live in a small lot and you have a fenced-in backyard, then what I would do is let them out the coop while being supervised um, to give them a way to stretch their legs. Um, let's see, the chicken coop that I got from Tractor Supply, I would say is probably about the length of this table and a little bit wider. Um, and the nest boxes are up here. So they end up having that, that full space there. Um, so I would say the size of this table would be good for four, but that's not necessarily optimal, um, but definitely give them opportunities to um, roam around the backyard while being supervised, because uh, then that gives them that that desire to forage and, and, and look for different things and be as chicken as chicken can be. So thank you so much. I really appreciate um, you guys coming and make sure to see uh, me and my daughter at our booth today.